So we're at the entrance of the old Cavendish building in the middle of Cambridge. And I guess one of the ways of thinking about this extraordinary site is it's kind of an onion. There are layers and layers of history and science superimposed on uh, each other here. Um, it's a sort of archaeological site. It's one of a very few number of um, extraordinarily rich scientific sites in the world. I mean, this is a spectacular place historically and scientifically. And we should start really by looking at this. Um, this looks to the untutored eye, and maybe even the tutored eye, like a medieval structure. Here are the pointed arches, the cobblestones, the beautifully engraved wooden gates with verses from the Psalms on them, and opposite what is in fact a genuinely medieval structure, which is this clunch wall facing us, which is the eastern wall of Corpus Christi Court. So the first thing that strikes you is this doesn't look like a modern building. This doesn't look like um, one of the sites where the modern world was invented, but it is. So we learn from this that in order for an extraordinary institution like a physics laboratory in the 1860s and the 70s to be um, inserted into the clerical university, it was necessary to surround it with the appearance of tradition. So you learn something from this kind of architecture that when experimental physics enters Cambridge University, in the 1860s and 70s. It's cutting edge, high tech science, but it looks like a medieval system. And that was deliberate. The first professor of experimental physics in Cambridge, James Clark Maxwell, a brilliant Scottish mathematician, expert in optics and electromagnetism, um, was very conscious when he was designing this building of the danger that the more traditional dons would sense in having such a challenging, difficult, modern institution. So the medieval layout with its porter's gatehouse, its gates and its cobbles, its pointed arches is quite deliberate. And Maxwell says in one of his letters in the early 1870s that um, if uh, he was too successful, then the parents of the students would be around his ears complaining that instead of studying mathematics, they were being made to work in a laboratory. And that would be a disaster. And why would it be a disaster? Because it was a challenge to a class idea, a social idea, of what an intellectual in Cambridge should do. An intellectual in Cambridge does pure mathematics and takes the mathematics tripos, which is a very competitive exam, and passes with flying colors and becomes a wrangler and does not work with his hands. Whereas what Maxwell and his allies were proposing here was practical engagement with experiments, with equipment, with instruments, and with the real phenomena of the world. And that seemed extremely challenging. So one's got to sort of think back to a world in which this is not tradition, this is radical modernity. There are other aspects of the design of the new lab which are very, very striking. If you look at the north wing, which is part of the original building, you notice, I hope, at least three things. One is, um, by 19th century standards, it's extremely big. This is a very large new building for a Victorian university. It can carry three workspaces on three floors, plus the support staff and uh, infrastructure, which was normally in the basement. Secondly, you see how large the windows are. The windows are deliberately large because Maxwell was proposing a series of experimental investigations which needed very steady, bright illumination. So he goes back, interestingly, he and his architect, to a kind of Georgian vision of what the facade should look like. Much bigger windows than would have been traditional at the time. And then the platform in front of the windows, and not as you might imagine for flower boxes, but for helioscopes, for mirrors which are driven by clocks which follow the path of the sun. So with that's the southern sky, right? 
So the sun moves during the day when there is sun uh, from that side to this. So you could bring sunlight into the, the lab and experiment on it. So it's an absolutely genial way of using um, solar light in this case to do experiments with spectroscopes, with prisms and lenses and so on. Okay, so it's this part and this part which is the Maxwell period. At that stage, what the Cavendish is doing in terms of research is almost entirely around the problems of electricity and magnetism, the cutting edge technology of the time, but analyzed in terms of Maxwell's new theory of electromagnetism, which he publishes in the early 1870s, the treatise on electricity and magnetism, which is the um, classical, as we would now say, statement of the claim that electromagnetic waves are waves in an ether, a fluid which fills all space, and light is a form of electromagnetic radiation, a revolutionary idea that one generation later will lead quite directly to Einstein's development of the special theory of relativity in 1905. So this is modern physics. The most important challenge for Maxwellian physics was measurement. It was necessary to turn this lab into a measurement institution. And in order to make precision measurements on light, electromagnetism, and so on, it was necessary to network, to link this building in a small market town in the East Midlands with the global networks of instrument making, commerce, trade, and industry. So although it looks cloistered, in fact, this is a global institution. This is a center of calculation. And it's closely linked to manufacturers in Liverpool and in Germany, in Paris, and in London who supply the hardware, the skills, the techniques, and many of the workmen who make the lab tick. And by the time of Maxwell's tragically early death in 1879, the Cavendish had become a standards institution for the world in which the value of the unit of electrical resistance, the ohm, was set here in these buildings by Maxwell, by his students, and by his brilliant but extremely eccentric successor, Lord Rayleigh, 